Okay, I'm Jim Armstrong from Gloversville, New York, and I was in the Navy, and I went in in August of 1943, and this is what I looked like at that time, 17-year-old kid. Okay, when I first went in, I went to Samson Navy Training Station in central New York and went through boot camp there. And then uh, at that time, the Navy was filling the compliments of all their carriers. They were coming out like crazy. So uh, I happened to be one of the guys that, that uh, got picked for carrier duty. So we went right to sea. Uh, we went right to sea. I enlisted in Albany and went to Samson Navy Training Station and put in my seven weeks there, and then they were filling the compliments for all the different carriers in the war. And so uh, I got picked for sea duty, and uh, uh, I went aboard the USS Hornet, CB-12, after the first one got sunk. And uh, from there, they didn't keep us very long. We uh, qualified our air groups in the Chesapeake and headed for Panama in the Pacific. And uh, in the Pacific, we uh, uh, picked up our admiral and headed for the Marshall Islands and, and ended up in Task Force 58 and 38, the Pacific Fleet. Uh, Halsey and Spruance and Mitcher were the admirals in charge. And uh, we made most of the major engagements from from the Marshall Islands to the war ended. Um, so the advance base for the fleet, 38 and 58 task force, was in Majural in the Marshall Islands. So that was our first stop. And uh, uh, from Majural, we started our hit and run operations on all the different islands. Uh, Marianas, New Guinea, and uh, and it worked up into the first battle of the Philippine Sea, where where the fleet caught the Japanese fleet, and uh, they uh, uh, ended up uh, uh, sinking quite a few of the Jap ships and then chasing them away. And in the meantime, uh, the the uh, carriers, the Jap carriers, were launching planes against us and uh, uh, the ship uh, gun crews, which I was a member of, we didn't shoot down too many. We got a few, but our air groups and our pilots were so good that they were getting them left and right. And uh, and that's what really uh, uh, wiped out the Jap fleet. They really put them on the run by shooting down all their, their uh, fighters and bombers. But they still got in, and that's about the time that they turned the Japanese turned to the kamikaze deal. And uh, then you were on alert constantly. As a matter of fact, we'd go to general quarters some days and stay right there for two, three days. And uh, then you uh, you ate in the gun tubs and slept there. And, and uh, it was just a waiting game, hurry up and wait, and hit one island after the other. Uh, then, uh, in the end of the end of uh, 1944, um, we ended up uh, going into a tremendous typhoon off the coast of of the Philippines, and uh, in the process, uh, our admiral at that time was Admiral Halsey, and, and uh, they didn't have the weather instruments to tell them what to do in those days. And we ended up going right through the eye of the storm, and uh, two or three of the the destroyers that were with us, the Hull, Spence, and Monahan, capsized and sunk with most all their their sailors aboard. And uh, uh, at the same time, uh, we'd been refueling at sea and chasing the remainder of the Jap carriers. And uh, that was at the time when the Seventh Fleet got cornered in the in the Philippines, and uh, so we had been suckered away, chasing the carriers north towards Japan, 
and uh, Admiral Halsey uh, took the bait, uh, which is uh, something he shouldn't have done, but he wanted them carriers bad. So when he got the alert that the Seventh Fleet had got trapped in the Philippines, he made a turnaround, made a speed run with the fleet back, and then we chased chased them away and and uh, tried to catch them another day. And through all of this, we're hitting different islands, Iwo Jima, Okinawa. We're making hit and run raids, and and uh, China and. Uh, French Indochina and, and uh, Formosa, and uh, Formosa was just a little island that nobody hears much about. Today is Taiwan, but uh, in those days uh, the uh, kamikazes were in full effect, and uh, we ended up. Uh, it was that was twelfth, uh, thirteenth, uh, and fourteenth of October. Uh, they come out after the fleet. And uh, uh, the one day we had we had uh, uh, four cruisers with us and a couple uh, battleships, and uh, they ended up uh, uh, hitting the cruiser Houston. And then uh, uh, one of the other cruisers, the Boston, took it in tow and and got it out of there. And uh, then the next day they brought in. Uh, the Canberra, and that night she got it, and so that took another cruiser. I think that was a Wichita, took her under tow and took her out. But that of all this stuff in the war, I think Formosa was the worst that I remember going through, and it was so bad that that the destroyers laid down a smoke screen to cover us up to get us out of there, and then uh, uh, from there. We ended up going into China, into into uh, to uh, what is today Vietnam, French Indochina, because that's where Halsey and the fleet commanders thought that thought that the uh, Japanese fleet had gone. But once we got over there, uh, they they only ended up sinking an old uh, Japanese battleship that had been in the China Sea, and it and it wasn't part of their major fleet. So uh, uh, some of the funny parts were, as we were going through the China Sea, uh, these uh, sand pans were coming out, and uh, everybody was afraid that they were equipped with radios and stuff and were sending in our positions and stuff. So they give us, the gunnery groups, permission to sing them. So uh, it was kind of funny. We'd get up fairly close, and... Uh, well, I was on a 20 millimeter, and that only had like a 2,200 yard range, so you had to be pretty close to to sink them. But it's funny, you get up alongside them, and you wouldn't see a soul, just floating there. Then all of a sudden, uh, uh, we'd get the order to commence firing. Boy, heads would pop up all over, and they'd jump over the side. We shot a few and sunk a few, and and uh, that was exciting and, and more fun than anything. But uh, and then we come back and uh, we pulled Christmas in, in another advanced base. The advanced base at that time had gone from uh, Majuro and Inuitok and Kwajalein and the Marshalls up to Ulithi Atoll. And uh, I think, if I remember, I was part of the Caroline Islands. But uh, that was now the new advanced base. And... Uh, uh, we went in there for Christmas, and it was strange for for Glover's old boy. It was used to snow for Christmas, and it was about 110 in the shade. And uh, from that, uh, uh, we started uh, uh, softening up Iwo Jima for the invasion there, and then we'd make strikes on Okinawa, and uh, uh, they just went from one island to the other, and and then. Uh, uh, from there, we got uh, from uh, Iwo Jima. We got into the Okinawa campaign, and uh, that's when uh, the kamikazes were coming out in droves. Uh, some reports were three, four hundred uh, Bettys, which is a light bomber, 
with the Baka bombs and and fighter escort and kamikazes. But there again, our pilots were real good and uh, well trained, had a lot of experience, and they shot down most of them before they got to. Them. But I can still remember plenty of days when the sky was full of uh, flak and uh, and planes flying all over. And by that time, you had the the uh, Imperial Air Force. Most of those guys had been killed, and you were getting the young kids that were now flyers, and they knew how to take the planes off. But I'm not sure if they ever knew how to land them. And if they did, they knew many good because they got shot down anyway. But uh, they would come out in droves, and um, we, w we were always amazed, like in the gunnery departments, because uh, the, the 20 millimeters... Uh, you could move them in most any direction you wanted to, right overhead if you wanted to. And these uh, planes would come in on such an angle that you didn't have to train very far. You could get right on them and, and uh, uh, follow them all the way in. And if you could get them in close enough, of course they started with the, our 5-inch guns would shoot way out. And then the 40s would be a little bit less than that. And then it was our turn. When they got into us, everybody started to scramble. But uh, in uh, uh, it was a March, I think it was the 19th of March. It was about the time that uh, the Franklin, the carrier Franklin, and the Bunker Hill, the Hancock, they were all getting hit with kamikazes. They took some tremendous hits. And we had a guy come down. I can remember uh, one of the guys in the island was in a, a uh, group that were lookout division and he spotted this plane coming in and uh, uh, I was this is the plane that came in and that just missed us and I was right up in here on the 20 millimeter and if you look close enough you can see our tracers coming across at him and when he come down he come right down and landed in the water on the other side of the ship and I guess he actually I guess he actually scorched the guys in the gun tubs on this side. He was so close when he came down. And I had a buddy that was in the after gun group. And when he came down and hit, they scrambled out of the plane. They were still alive. They scrambled out of the plane. And as it went floating back, this guy was training the gun on him, shooting him as they were getting out. And uh, uh, it was such a scary thing that... All these planes on the flight deck were loaded with torpedoes and bombs and and uh, uh, napalm gas and uh, uh, ammunition. They had everything. They were ready for a strike, and they were all churned up, and the pilots were in them. And when this happened, the pilots got out, so they told me I was up for it. I didn't see it, but they said the pilots got out and actually shook hands with the, with the, the gunnery department. They were glad they got them because they knew that they were dead ducks if he had ever hit. But it was quite uh, quite a thing, and, and uh, uh, we were one of the fortunate ones. We got strafed, and I lost a couple of friends in strafing, but uh, we had near misses with bombs and that type of thing, but the kamikazes never got to us. They got close, but they didn't get us. And uh, uh, this picture here happened to be uh, one that uh, um, was... Uh, um, portrayed in in a uh, a photograph apparently, and then this guy painted it. This Schepler was a famous World War II artist, and, and he painted a lot of action shots. And I never thought much about it until I had a nephew that worked in Washington, uh, and he worked in the Navy Yard. And he said to me, Uncle Jim, I'll, when you're down, we'll go out to lunch and we'll go over to the to the officer's mess and have lunch and at the Navy Yard. And uh, he said, then I'll take you over to the art gallery and the museum that they have in the Navy Yard in Washington. And when I walked in the door of the art gallery, there was a, a wall on the left-hand side as you walked in. I don't know how big it was, a tremendous wall. And this painting took up the whole wall. And I said, oh, geez, I was in that picture <laughs> somewhere. And... Uh, so that's why I brought it in, because uh, it turned out that uh, every time they make an advertisement on a World War II book 
or a magazine, you always see this picture. It's one of the most famous ones in World War II. And uh, getting back to to uh, uh, bombs and stuff, we had some close misses with them, but uh, I wrote a story. It's in those uh, stories there about uh, that was in the that was in the uh, the fall of '45. Uh, the Navy had a condition in the gun tubs. When there was no bogies or planes on the radar screen, the, uh, we'd be at general quarters, and, and they would set a condition they called one easy. And everything in the Navy is done by starboard watch and port watch. So this particular day, it was a nice sunny day, a cloud here and there, but not much. And they said, uh, uh, the port watch, go below and have a sandwich, a cup of coffee, and, and most of the the starboard watch can go below too. Just leave a couple of guys in the gun tub with the phone and and uh, a lookout. So naturally I got picked for a lookout. So a fellow from Syracuse and myself were in the gun tub all by ourselves. We're just sitting there and looking out. It's nice. And and all of a sudden I heard a plane uh, engine. And we started looking around and all of a sudden I looked up and uh, this... Uh, Japanese Judy was diving on us, uh, and uh, he had us. Here, here comes a kamikaze. We figured this is it, and uh, he could have strafed, and he didn't, and he could have crashed us, and he didn't, but he did have a bomb on his left wing, and it was about, I always thought it was about a 500-pounder. I never really knew. So when I saw the guy, I yelled and nudged the guy with the phones, and he reported it to the island where the gunnery officer was. And with that, I yelled to the guys, kamikaze, and they all come pouring out of the, the clipping room and uh, manning their guns. And uh, as he came down, he dropped this bomb. And I can see it coming, and it wasn't no more than uh, 30 feet of, at the most away from us when it went under us. But right uh, uh, on the forward end of the flight deck, the gun tub sticks out from the flight deck, and it come right down through that corner and right underneath the gun tub and exploded in the water and did no harm. But, uh, oh, I don't know, about 40 years later, I went to buy a, a new truck, and, and one of the salesmen said to me, uh, gee, my dad was on the Hornet. And I said, he was. I said, what division was he in? He said, I don't know, he said, when I get back in the office with you, we'll get his book out. Well, as it turned out, he was on the Wasp, and that was one of our sister ships, and at that particular day, they were traveling with us, and they were on our starboard side, and uh, uh, somebody on the Wasp had taken a picture of, of this happening, this bomb coming down, and the explosion. I never, I never felt the water. But there was such a water spray that went up, I've got the picture home, but, but it was such a uh, water spray that we had to get wet, but I don't remember it. That anyway, uh, uh, shortly after, she took a bomb hit, and uh, the wasp, that was one of the most scenic ones I've ever seen because we were headed into the wind, and she took a, a bomb down what we called the Charlie Noble was a stack that went down into the kitchen for ventilation. And when it exploded, you know, it got the gas lines and the whole works. And the first thing that the carriers do, a fire is one of the dreaded things. You turn out of the wind because that's what fans it. And when, when we looked at the wasp, she was turning out of the wind. And as she went around in a circle, she would turn like this. And this whole side, the whole length of the wasp will look like Niagara Falls, all the fire. The whole thing, was, I figured she was done, but they got it out. And it's amazing what these guys did, these young guys uh, that were nothing more than just uh, seamen, deck apes. And uh, they were signed to fire gangs, and, and I'd seen them put on their asbestos suit and walk through that stuff. And... It's amazing what some of these guys did. 
And uh, today, though, you're lucky if you can get anybody to talk about it. And nobody ever thought anything about it. I never did for years. I worked with guys that was was in the, like the fourth division to hit the beachhead in Normandy. One of my best friends that I worked with never mentioned, never t he told me the funny things. He told me the funny things to, about getting when he got wounded and all, but, uh, and that was all. A, a good time laughing over that because he, uh, he was an infantryman with the, the fourth and he was uh, marching. The sniper got him through the legs. So they came and they put him on a litter. And those days, apparently, I didn't know much about the Army, but they put him on a litter on the back of a Jeep and they were transporting him to a, to a medic. And uh, uh, he said, I laid on the back of the Jeep with another guy and we're going up the road. And uh, uh, both sides of the road would line with infantry moving forward. And all of a sudden, a German plane came in strafing. So those guys all ducked into the ditch. And he said they left me up on the, on the Jeep all alone. He said, I'm young. You SOBs come back and get me. He never got hit. But uh, uh, we always laughed. That's the type of thing you always talked about. And with the veterans groups today, that's what most of them talk about. They don't talk about the uh, action stuff, and uh, and uh, you often wondered why. And and uh, the only thing I can uh, imagine is like I was watching Tom Brokaw one night, and he was talking about uh, uh, the veterans of World War II, and and out of all the veterans, something like one out of six actually saw action, and so those guys don't want to talk about it. And the guys that didn't see it, they go, ah, I didn't see nothing. And uh, uh, like Bill Galpin, Bill Galpin was on the Gambrio Bay and the Independence, two carriers that saw a lot of service. And every time I talked to Bill, he goes, ah, I was a snipe. I was down the engine room. I never saw anything. But that was the difference. My cousin in Northville, Dave Armstrong, Christ, he had 14 battle stars, never saw anything. He was a radio man. He had phones on. He was in a radio shack. So all the stuff that he went through, he didn't see any of it. He was there, but he didn't see any of it. Where when you were in a gunnery group, like up on the flight deck, you saw everything. Everything. You weren't nothing more than just a gunner, but you saw everything that went on. And uh, uh, you, were, you were right there. Uh, actually, where I was on the flight deck forward was right by... The, we only had one catapult uh, on this ship. A lot of them had two, one on each side. But my gun group was right by the catapult. And they was uh, always bringing planes forward and launching from the catapult. And this one particular day, they, they, uh, uh, the plane, a fighter plane come up and he had his wings folded yet. And uh, on his wings they had mounted, uh, I think it was something like six rockets. And... Uh, as he got up close to the catapult, they were hooking him up to the catapult, and uh, the flight deck officer give the the flight deck crew members uh, the word to go to. He's going to open the wings, and when he opens the wings, they grab a hold of him and push him forward, and then they lock in place. And as these wings went forward, we were all leaning on the flight deck like this, and as the wings went forward, all these rockets dropped here. Well, what the hell? We didn't know nothing about them. We figured. They'd explode any minute, but they didn't. And nobody thought anything about it. The flight deck crew come over, they handed them to us, and we turned around and threw them over the side. <laughs> and they went on with the, with the next one. And then uh, uh, it was so hot in the Pacific that you couldn't sleep in your compartment much. I didn't anyway. I slept up topside in the breeze and the catwalks. And I used to sleep right by my gun tub. And... Uh, I crawled in one night and I was laying on the, you weren't supposed to do it, but we, those uh, life preservers, we had those KPOC life preservers, were comfortable as hell. They were a nice mattress. So I slipped in there and I got on the, on the uh, life preservers and I was, was sleeping and during the night, they were always launching planes day and night. Uh, they had the night fighters with the radar they would send out if they had bogeys that come in. And... Uh, so this particular night, uh, we didn't pay any attention. The 
flight that crews were bringing them in and launching them. And uh, I heard a hell of a crash, and I didn't know what it was. We got up, we came out in the gun tub, and all the catwalk forward of us was ripped off, and it screwed up and went over the side. They never got the pilot, by the way. He, he ended up uh, drowning. But uh, I think uh, in a situation like that, uh, the accidents were worse than the, the engagements. We went through a lot of stuff. You never thought anything about it. Uh, well, you were scared at times, but uh, uh, it's all the accidents. Jesus, I had more friends got killed from stupid things, riding the elevators up with a, a torpedo on, get caught in the elevator. Another guy was a plane handler, and he got run over. He was pulling on the wheel instead of pushing, and he slipped and fell, and the wheel went over him. He died of internal injuries and a lot of stupid stuff, a lot of burns and, and uh, a lot of accidents. And I would say, uh, um, I'm sure somebody knows, but I bet we lost two, three hundred guys just in accidents in two and a half years. And... Uh, I can remember going back again to, to when we qualified our air group in the Chesapeake Bay. We had uh, uh, SB2Cs. They were fairly new. They were having a lot of problems from a, a Curtis dive bomber it was. And they were qualifying these guys. And what we used to do is we'd get called to general quarters and train on them as they dove on the ship. That was their practice. And we always pull a sled behind, a steel plate behind, and they dive on that and drop water bombs on it. And I see one right after the other come down diving on it. Never pull out two guys in there. They keep right on going. We go, oh, jeez. And uh, so they lost a slew of guys before they figured out their problem. The fighters were good, and the TBFs, the, the torpedo bombers, didn't have too much problem, but... Uh, uh, there again, uh, uh, when you get you get in the Pacific, they had a lot of trouble. Like uh, uh, like one particular time, a torpedo bomber for some reason couldn't release his torpedo. And as a rule, if they come back with a bomber or a torpedo, they made them ditch. They made them ditch the plane, bail out, or land it in the water. And this one particular day, a guy came in with a torpedo in the bomb bay. And usually they would tell, we had two guys in the gun groups with phones on, and they'd tell them, there's a plane coming in with, with a bomb or a torpedo or whatever. And uh, uh, we were told, get your head down. And because uh, the flight deck was just about head level in the gun group I was in at that time. And uh, I remember looking down the flight deck, and... Uh, uh, as I did, I see this torpedo coming up the flight deck. It must have ripped loose from the plane that's coming up the flight, and it landed just about midships, stopped right alongside the island. And with that, a, a chief petty officer was on the flight deck crew. He jumped in the gun tub. Everybody jumped in our gun tubs to get out of the way of it. And uh, I'm peeking up. I'm curious. And he said, get your head down. You want to get it blowed off? But I peaked up again a little while later and uh, uh, a chief torpedo man was in charge of those. He come out with a stick. He didn't think nothing of it. He come out with a broom handle or something and stuck it down in the prop and he called out three or four guys and they rolled over the side and dumped it over the side. <laughs> he knew more than we did. We didn't. Uh, we expected it to blow anything. If it ever went, it had a 2,000 pound warhead. Jesus would blow the island off probably. But uh, then another time, uh, speaking of accidents, uh, we had just got in the Pacific, and the planes were coming back from strikes on New Guinea. And uh, uh, this one uh, dive bomber uh, had a 100-pound uh, anti-personnel bomb, and he couldn't drop it, and it was hanging. And uh, they told him he couldn't land. He had to shake it loose. And he went around us couple of times, but it wouldn't shake loose. And they said, well, it's not coming off. Come on in. You're all right. And that particular day, I was in uh, an after-gun group, and, and uh, I was on the phones that day, and the word I got was to get everybody below because there was a plane coming in with a bomb on. 
So I got everybody down into the clipping room, and this plane made the sir. I didn't see much what it did, but it came around and uh, landed. And the next thing I know, I heard a hell of an explosion I didn't hear for about a week. And what had happened, that the, his wheels hit the flight deck and that bomb come loose and made about two bounds on the flight deck and the second bound, uh, bound had exploded. And the first thing I saw when I come up out was uh, a couple of guys that we used to shoot the breeze with a lot. They were the guys that were... Uh, uh, resting gear operators, they would run out and release the cables on the hooks. And uh, the one guy, a fellow named Chase, he was from New York State. I see him laying there with his guts alongside of him. And he come up one time and looked around and then went down. But I think we lost uh, uh, three guys. And then we had an officer right close. He jumped in the gun tub. He'd been hit above the knee. And we laid him down and, and yelled for a medic and got him out of there. One guy under the flight deck, he lost both legs. So there was there was quite a few guys that got hit. And uh, that's the type of thing that you were up against all the time. And and uh, I another action I can remember is we used to go ashore in uh, Ulithi and have beach parties, R&R &R they call it. And they would... Uh, come out with LCMs and come alongside and uh, you had to go down a cargo net and then jump into the LCM and if the sea was at all rough they were coming up and down as they come in well you better hit that LCM on the upswing because if you hit it on the downswing you would get trapped it would crush you so we had a couple of guys who got killed that way they grabbed it on the wrong swing and uh, the barge come up and crushed them to death, and, and, uh, and of course we had the normal things, guys with operations and heart attacks, the older guys, and and uh, but as far as uh, the uh, the air groups lost quite a few guys, pilots and gunnery, uh, and some guys would would be on a lot of missions and they'd get to a point where they just had enough and they wouldn't go no more. Yeah, the, the uh, fighter pilots we had were real good. We had crack air groups. We had three air groups and they were all super. And uh, they made a lot of aces. And the ace, probably everybody knows, is, is uh, shoot down five planes. And we had quite a few of those guys that had five. And going back to, to uh, uh, 44, the Marianas turkey shoot, Guam, Saipan, and Tinian, this one guy was up for, after the war, was up for the Congressional Medal of Honor because he shot down seven in one, one uh, operation. He, uh, what the Japanese did is they sent... They sent their their your uh, their carrier sent their planes after us with bombs and fighters and stuff, and after they would drop all their stuff on the fleet, they would land at Guam, and because they still had Guam in the Marianas, and they would reload gas and bombs and hit us on the way back. But what happened is our fighter pilots, this one the guy they call Spider Webb, he was a yeah, Spider Webb was one of the, the fighter pilots that that spotted this, the Japs landing on Guam and reloading and then hitting us on the way back to their ship. And he spotted that and he would follow them into Guam and they didn't have any ammunition to shoot back at them or no bombs or nothing. They got rid of everything. And so he would just fall in behind them and shoot them down one after the other. So he had, uh, uh, he got uh, ace in one day. And there was more than just him. The Lexington had a guy. He uh, did similar, and he had six or seven. So um, these guys were keeping us safe, these pilots. And it uh, uh, was right about that time that uh, was just before that, matter of fact, that uh, uh, we, were, we had Admiral Clark, Jocko Clark, aboard our ship, and we were the uh, flagship 
of one group of Task Force 58. There was like three groups, uh, Task Force 58.123, and, and, and it kept increasing as the war went on. It kept bigger until there was five or six groups in just uh, Task Force 58 and 38. And uh, so the message came back uh, from a destroyer that they had located a guy on... Uh, on Guam that had been signaling out to them. They hadn't invaded Guam yet. And so they was looking for all the information they could get on Guam. And I don't know if you've ever heard of George Tweed. Have you ever heard of Tweed? And no man is an island. You ever hear the story? They made a movie on him and everything after the war. But he was a radio man on Guam since 1939. And he was one of the survivors of the Navy uh, personnel that were on Guam and he avoided the Japanese for all those years, for four years, supposedly. All those years, everybody had been evacuated with the exception of a few guys, and he was one of them. And the rest of them all got killed. They got picked up by the Japanese and shot. And he went into the caves in the mountains and avoided them. But anyway, at this time, he he got to the, to the water. He was a radio man. And... He knew Morse code and the signal and the light business. And so he rigged up a light and signaled one of our ships when it got close. And then they arranged to pick him up and they brought him to the ship. He, they brought him to our ship being the, the uh, uh, flagship and they interrogated him. But I can still see him the day he came aboard with the long hair and the beard. He looked like a wild man from Borneo or something. But I remember the the admiral give him a spot rate on the right on the spot. He went to cheap, and they fed him, and uh, uh, then they transferred him home. I never heard any more or whatever happened, but I do know they made a movie about his life after the war. And uh, I'm sure if anybody sees this tape, somebody will remember seeing the movie. But uh, uh, going forward, you get up into... Uh, Okinawa and Iwo Jima, uh, there's uh, where the kamikazes were going nuts. And uh, uh, they were coming out in droves. And uh, I remember it was uh, um, just short. I always called it Memorial Day, but it was actually the 30th of May. We'd been general quarters most of the night and during the day. And... Uh, my division had the breeches boy on the fantail. And every time ships had come alongside to, to be oiled, uh, we would refuel them. And uh, we always threw a line over. They call it a high line. They'd throw it over to the destroyer, and they'd hook it up to their gun tubs, and they'd send a basket back and forth. And uh, one particular time, they came alongside, and, and they had 155 Jap prisoners. And we had to bring them all over. We brought them over two at a time in the breeches boy. So we had a pretty good workout. And actually, a couple of guys didn't want to get captured, so they jumped out of the basket. And one of the officers, the hell with them, let them go, and they let them swim back. Apparently, they drowned. But anyway, we had them for quite a while. And uh, and then this uh, this other time, uh, uh, we was receiving destroyers on the fantail. We would usually... If they picked up uh, any downed pilots, they'd bring them back, and, and we'd hook up the high line with a basket, and, and we'd bring our pilots back aboard that way. And so we were, uh, we were called to the, the, the uh, breeches boy that day, and uh, uh, that was late in the afternoon. And uh, we, did, we received two or three destroyers and did what he was going to do. And then they uh, uh, had general quarters again, and and uh, that's when I got hit. But that was the end of the war for me. I said, that's enough war. I don't want no more of that. But it was a funny thing. You'd often read about guys in the Civil War and World War I, how they, how they got shot on the last day of the war. Now, this was the, the 30th of May. And the 4th and 5th of June, which is four or five days later, we hit that tremendous typhoon off of Okinawa, and it caved in our bow and, and smashed up the other ships. 
and the war was all over for us anyway. We come back to the States on you know, the 15th of June, so that was that was the end of that. But anyway, uh, all those years, I could have used the Purple Heart back in those days because it was worth money and it was worth points to get discharged. But I never got it. It was always in my records, but I never got it. And, and uh, after the war, I said, what the hell, I don't care anything about it. But my kids were always after me. Ah, oh, you got it coming, Dad. You should, yeah, you go get it, you know. <laughs> so one day, Joe, Joe Hill spotted it in my records. And he said, did you ever get that? And I said, no. He said, I get it for you. And I'll be damned if he didn't. <laughs> he got it. It don't mean as much now as it did then, but it, it's kind of a pretty, it's a pretty thing. Can zero on. But it's a nice collector's item, and I'm sure my kids will get some some kick out of that. And, uh, along with that, I got all this other fruit salad. I got all this other fruit salad. It all means something, believe it or not. But uh, uh, each one has each one has a different meaning. And uh, uh, when you go into uh, when you go into different campaigns, every uh, major island, every major battle that you go into, they give you a, a bronze star for, and uh, uh, five five bronze stars you get a silver, and then uh, uh, then they go back to the bronze. And if you got ten, you'd have two silver stars on the on the Asiatic Pacific. We had ended up with nine. And on the Philippine Liberation Ribbon, we ended up with two. And then uh, after the war, they sent me the the presidential unit citation, and that had a that had a star on. And uh, then you got the China Theater and uh, occupation, and the Philippines give us a couple of ribbons. And uh, then these here to our New York State. Uh, Ribbon Joe probably knows what are the ones is conspicuous service cross. cross and the other is a star, right? I think one's a star American and one's a, uh, yeah, meritorious service star. And that's uh, that's about all the decorations I had, other than maybe my ruptured duck when they discharged this is this thing here. But as far as stripes, us kids, we didn't have no stripes, <laughs> we didn't get no ratings. There was, somebody had to get killed before you got raided, and uh, I don't know. Uh, most of this came about later in years uh, when you were on the ship. The first five or six, um, the ship uh, made sure you got because these are in your records, and if if you went ashore and you didn't have them on, uh, they would actually bring you up on charges because you're out of uniform if you don't have them on. So uh, anyway, I kept my uniform and I put them on, and and uh, it's a conversation piece. Uh, well, anyway, Joe was asking about the werewolf after the war was over. Um, I could have got transferred off. They wanted to send me to a a psycho hospital. I guess I was Asiatic by that time, and I wouldn't go. I said, Nah, I go stay with the ship. Because they were going back and forth, the war was over, and now they had to bring all these troops back. And uh, so we made three or four trips to the Marianas and Pearl Harbor and loaded up with civilian workers that had rebuilt Pearl Harbor after she was bombed. They were the first guys to come back. And then after that, we started bringing back uh, CBs and uh, Navy nurses and Anybody that was on the island, they called that, they called that the magic carpet duty, and they took the big carriers like that I was on, and they welded hundreds of bunks on the hangar deck, and that's what we was doing, bringing them troops back, and that's what I was doing right up till I got discharged. But talking about that werewolf that I wrote the article about, they would always take kids, uh, recruits. And they would always send one for a bucket of steam or left-hand monkey wrench or some foolish thing. 
Well, the Navy had what they called a, a mail buoy watch. And what they do is they tell these kids to go up. Uh, we was talking about the werewolf. Uh, what they did is they, they took some kid that had just come aboard. And one night it was, was dark. And as you went along in the Pacific, uh, especially on a dark night, the phosphorus in the water as the wake would come, this phosphorus would light up. And uh, so this this kid, he got picked for uh, mail buoy watch. So he said, this kid, you got to go up on the flight deck. you got to go forward and dark and lonely and scary. And he went up on, on the flight deck, and they told him, you got to go up forward, and you got to watch out for this mail buoy. When you see this mail buoy coming, you got to yell to us, and we'll pick it up. So anyway, uh, this kid's up on the flight deck, and he's... Uh, uh, looking out, and nobody knows what's going on, you know, just the guys that set him up there. And all of a sudden, this kid comes running down the flight deck yelling, mailboy, mailboy, mailboy. Well, the guy on the island don't know what the hell he's talking about. He thinks he's yelling, man overboard. Well, during the war, they never stop a ship. If man's overboard, they signal somebody to pick him up. They don't stop for him. But this particular night, we stopped. We stopped, and they... Uh, I ran down the hangar deck to see what was going on, and and what they did is they had a crew that they put on a motor whaleboat, and they lowered them over the side on a boom, and they went to pick up this man overboard. But they got down the, in the water, and they couldn't find nothing. They brought him back, and they started investigating, and so they found out that they, the guys had set this kid up, and and of course the captain got on, got give everybody hell, but. <laughs> But I tell all these stories, you know, I don't know if anybody believes me or not, but but uh, I've always been more proud of of what my family did. We had we had eight all together, uh, cousins and uncles. As it started out, my father and his three brothers, born in the 1890s, were all World War I vets, and three of them had been in France during the war. They had a hell of a lot of service. And... Uh, us kids all come out of them. And my one uncle was in the army in France. He was one of the, well, my brother was the first. He enlisted in 39 in the National Guard, and he was in until 45. And then my, my cousin, Art, he went in, uh, he went in right after Christmas, 1941, after the attack. And he went to boot camp and never got home. He, he went right to sea. And he went out on the Enterprise, and he's one of the few guys that I know from Fulton County. I don't know anybody else. I'm sure there was that was at Midway. Yeah, he went through all of that, the Coral Sea battle. And then after Midway, they went back to the Coral Sea, and he got killed in the Coral Sea. He got hit with a, uh, his. he was in a gunnery division and uh, got hit aft, and it killed 74 guys. They buried... 74 guys the next day at sea, and he was one of them. And then my uncle that had been in World War I, uh, he worked for Niagara Mohawk, and uh, uh, he got a rate uh, as a chief electrician's mate, and he went in the Seabees. But he was 49 years old, and it was too much for him. And during basic training in Virginia, I think Camp Allen, one of the CB bases, he dropped dead at the end of basic training. So that was two. And then my brother and I uh, both went overseas about the same time. Uh, my brother went over, I think, in October or November of uh, uh, 43, and then I went right after that. And he went to the 8th and 9th Air Force, and they had a hell of a lot of service. And uh, uh, he would... He was in. Uh, he was in armor in the Eighth Air Force, and what he would do is, as these planes would land, they would uh, uh, bring out bombs and ammunition and load the planes, uh, planes for the next strike. Every once in a while, one of the gunners would get hit, or get sick, or chicken out for any reason. He didn't want to make the nice next flight. They would ask these armors, "Anybody want to go on this flight?" My brother, that dummy, he would volunteer. And he went up on a half a dozen 
uh, bombing raids. And uh, matter of fact, he was up D-Day, and he was up the day before. He told me, and he said, as we flew over the coast of France, it wasn't nothing. You know, you see the the pillboxes and all the armor the Germans had, was well, nothing. He said the next day we went in, and he said, "Holy great, you're going to walk across the water on the ships." So I always thought of that. And then uh, that was uh, uh, the third one. And then uh, then my cousin Dave, he went in. Uh, he was 16. He went in on his 16th birthday, listed in the Navy. And uh, Dave ended up, he was on the cruiser Cleveland, and he ended up with the Asiatic Pacific Ribbon and and 14 battle stars and a uh, good conduct medal. I don't know how the hell he got it, but he did. <laughs> and then, uh, uh, then of course, then I went in, and my cousin Marge was a wave, and uh, she was a cryptographer, I think they call them, in the waves. And all together... Oh, I had one other cousin. He got he was one of the first draftees from Gloversville, Bob Armstrong, and he got killed in the Battle of the Bulge. And uh, he's buried in France in the same cemetery with General Patton in France. And so out of eight of us, uh, three didn't return. And uh, it was nice they got the memorial up there and put their names in. And uh, uh, I, that's what I was always kind of proud of. All the records a story on this and I wrote down all the stuff that that I could think of that I I was pretty sure of and out of those eight guys uh, out of six of us mainly uh, they were in uh, uh, they ended up with uh, numerous medals and ribbons and they ended up with 45 battle stars so for that one from Africa to Africa to Europe to to Pacific and and they covered the war pretty good. I had one other cousin, a cousin everybody knew Bugs. He was a hell of an athlete, and there was two Bugs, old and young. But most everybody don't know old Bugs, but they did know young Bugs because he was an excellent athlete. And he was on one of my sister ships, the Intrepid. And uh, they got every. We called the Intrepid the Magnet because every time we went out, they got hit. So uh, uh, I saw Bugs quite a few times in the Pacific, and he, he also ended up with quite a few battle stars and ribbons. And uh, of course, he, he got married fairly young, so when the war was over, he got home quick. Where the rest of us kids, we had to stay and help bring back these people. So I guess that's about it. Did you run out of tape, Frank? Also, when, you know, because when I was... String used to collect all that stuff. Yeah, my name is Jim Armstrong. I uh, was in the Navy during World War II. I did an interview uh, through these fellows once before of myself. Today I'm more interested in uh, the family. I had talked uh, to them after the interview about uh, about uh, uh, I was more proud of the the family's record than I was of, of my own. I mean, I had a pretty good record, but these guys are fantastic. And uh, uh, it started off, uh, my grandparents uh, married in the 1890s, and they had all boys, and four of them came along just about the time uh, World War I started. They, uh, they were teenagers, and all four of them ended up in, in the Navy and the Army, and World War I went all the way through that. And then after they had their own families, they had all us kids, there was uh, seven of us kids that went on in to the service for World War II. We came along just at that time. And uh, the one brother, my uncle Liam, uh, he ended up enlisting and going in the Seagees as a chief electrician's mate. But he didn't, uh, he was too old at the time and the, the training was too much for him. He dropped dead in basic training. But uh, 
the first one to really go in was my brother, Elton Bud Armstrong. He enlisted as a 15, 16 year old kid in the 27th Division, New York National Guard. And uh, uh, he went on to uh, uh, the Louisiana maneuvers and, and uh, he was in training at Fort Drum with the, at the Pine Camp in those days they called it with the 27th and before the war started. And matter of fact, he was up there in training in the summer of 40 when Roosevelt came through reviewing the troops and he had a, uh, they had a huge parade and, and my parents and I went up to see my brother in the parade and we watched Roosevelt go, out, go by in his open touring car with his cigarette holder and his cigarette and, and just like you see him in the movies, you know. But from there, uh, Bud went to those Louisiana maneuvers and he was always blind in one eye since he was a kid. But somehow he got in the National Guard. But they found it in, in uh, I think that was in 41, early in 41, they found it. And they discharged him with medical discharge. But when Pearl Harbor came along, he memorized the eye chart and went back in and spent another four years. And he spent his time in the 8th and 9th Air Force. And uh, he had some pretty good experiences. He talked about, uh, he was, uh, he was an armor. He used to load the planes with their ammunition bombs and bullets and stuff. And then he would uh, uh, volunteer every once in a while when a gunner would get sick and wasn't going to make a bombing run. Uh, he'd volunteer and go as a gunner. He made quite a few trips like that. And D-Day was one of them. He said he was, they were over uh, the, the French coast the day before and there wasn't anything just sand in the water, you know. And he said the next day when they went over, he said, oh, Christ, you can walk ashore and all the different ships that were there. And uh, so that was quite an experience with him. Anyway, he went on through the war, stayed till 45, the fall of 45 when the war got over. And uh, um, at the end of, uh, 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 the end of his time in, uh, the Battle of the Bulge came along and he had had infantry experience so he volunteered to go back in when they were looking for replacements. So he was actually up in Belgium with an infantry outfit when the war ended. And then to go to the next one, my cousin Art Armstrong, he enlisted right after, uh, uh, right after Pearl Harbor uh, to go right after Christmas. And uh, Art was one of the very few that I know in this area. I'm sure there was more, but he's the only one that I can think of from this whole Fulton County area was at the Battle of Midway on the Carrier Enterprise. And uh, uh, shortly after uh, the Midway Battle, the Carrier Enterprise uh, went with, the, or about the same time, went with uh, the Doolittle Raiders the old USS Hornet on the Tokyo raid. And then uh, they came back and they went into the, the uh, Coral Sea and uh, uh, they got bombed by Jap planes and, and he took a direct hit in the gun tub and, and got killed along with 75 other guys. And uh, so uh, uh, that was two of our family that, that uh, uh, had died right early in the war. And then my cousin Dave, Art's brother, he enlisted on his 16th birthday. And uh, this is Dave here, if you can get a close-up of him. And uh, Dave enlisted and uh, ended up on the USS Cleveland cruiser. And uh, he was in the uh, uh, African campaign and uh, the invasion of Africa and then when they got through with that they came back and he went into Pacific and went all through the Pacific War through 43, 44 and into 45. So Dave had a lot of service and uh, uh, 
from that is Brother Bug Armstrong, Carl, Carl Arm. Everybody knows him as Bug around here because he was quite an athlete. He, uh, he enlisted after his brother Art got killed. And uh, he ended up in the Navy. He, he, uh, he enlisted in the Air Force, I understand, first. But for some reason, he didn't, didn't qualify. And uh, he'd only had a year or so of college. And I don't know what the requirements were. But anyway, he fell back on the Navy and became a radioman. Matter of fact, both him and Dave were both radioman first class. And now a bug ended up on the, on the uh, Carrier Ranger after radio school in the fall of uh, 42. And he also ended up in the invasion of Africa where they had uh, uh, quite a battle with the French fleet. And uh, from there he came back and then he got transferred to the brand new aircraft carrier Intrepid, which is now a museum in New York. And uh, Bug was a, a plank owner, the original crew member on the Intrepid. And uh, uh, he took that into the Pacific and went all the way through the Pacific campaign at the end of 43, 44, and 45. And, uh, uh, I used to see him. The Intrepid was a sister ship to the one I was on, the Hornet. And uh, every time she'd get hit, we'd pull back in the advance base, and I'd grab a whaleboat and go over and see Bug, and we'd have lunch and, and play pitch and catch and monkey around for the day. That happened quite often because we got where we called the Intrepid the Magnet, because every time she went out, she took a bomb or a kamikaze or something. She got hit had an awful loss of life. And uh, at the end uh, of uh, the war, uh, the Intrepid got hit in Okinawa and they brought her back. And uh, uh, Bug ended up getting transferred to the brand new aircraft carrier, Tarawa. But uh, I don't think she ever went to sea because the war ended. And uh, he got out right away. And. Uh, Now that uh, uh, was one, two, three, four, and myself five. And uh, then we had another cousin who was a son of Leon, the one that died in the Seabees. Robert, he, got, he was one of the first draftees. I don't know if you can get that in your picture, Frank, but you can try it. He was one of the first fellows from Fulton County to get drafted. And he was in the Army uh, early in 42. Bob was in the Coast Artillery, and it was funny. We used to laugh about it because he was stationed over near Boston. And uh, uh, he used to come home about every weekend on, on a, a 24 or 48-hour pass. He was home a lot. But then he got transferred to, they got shipped over to, to England, and he was in coast artillery in England. And most of the war, that's what he was, coast artillery, and he had a racket. But right at the end, when they were looking for replacements for the Battle of the Bulge, he had had uh, infantry experience also. And uh, uh, whether he volunteered or he got drafted as a replacement, he went. And uh, he went uh, through the Battle of, uh, uh, of uh, the Bulge, and then when they were they were up in Koblenz and getting ready to cross the Rhine, and uh, from one of the fellows from Gloversville that was with him told the family that he got hit directly with a mortar, and uh, uh, he's buried in France in the same cemetery that that uh, General Patton is in. And uh, uh, matter of fact, he was with Patton's Third Army. He was in the 80th Infantry Division. So that's the third one that never returned. Then there was one more. Uh, Art, Art and Dave and, and uh, uh, Bug had a sister, uh, Marge. And she was taking nurses training in Gloversville. 
and she uh, she was like a, a radiology technician, and she developed some sort of a, a rash or something, and she was forced to get out of nursing. So she goes in the waves. So she uh, enlisted in the waves. This is Marge here. She enlisted in the Navy waves, and uh, I think she went to Hunter's College, was a training, and then she ended up as a, a cryptographer, and busting codes and that type of thing. And uh, she spent a couple of years in the Navy before she got discharged. And uh, uh, the reason I wanted to talk about all these guys and my cousin Marge is uh, throughout all the war, with all the medals and, and uh, battle stars, uh, they had a uh, tremendous amount of uh, ribbons and, and uh, commendations and presidential, and there was three Purple Hearts involved in the three of us. And uh, all together, they qualified for something like 45 battle stars, which is unheard of, you know, I mean, uh, every major engagement you went in, you earned a star. And all together they had something like 45 battle stars. And I thought that was pretty good and it ought to be something that got put into this uh, video thing. So I guess that's about it. I guess I talked about all of them. I had talked before about my uncle Liam, who would originally uh, he went in uh, the army and must have been about 1915 or 16, and he was in the Mexican border campaign, and then he went into the World War One uh, campaign. He was in matter of fact, him and my father, who was a sailor, met in France and. Uh, uh, that was a funny thing. The ship had pulled into La Havre, France, and he was looking over the side of the ship, and a a uh, uh, colonel's car pulled up with the flags flying. And so my father said, "Gee, look at that! Wonder who's driving that car." And it was his brother. When he got it, it was his brother. So he said that two of them. He yelled to them. The two of them got together, and they went into La Havre. And he said the only night he ever slept in a GI can. He got, they got into the uh, snops or the, the uh, mint juleps or something, he said, and uh, they got a snootful, but he'd met him in, in uh, France. And then uh, uh, Leon came out of the service, and he did pretty well for himself with Niagara Mohawk, New York Power and Light Net. And that's, that's uh, uh, where he was at when he... Uh, decided to sign up for the Seabees in World War uh, II. And this is his picture here. And uh, uh, with the training was just too much for him at 49. And he dropped dead uh, right at the end of training. But uh, he was he was how old at that point? He was 49 years old at that time. And apparently it was just too much for him. And uh, it's a funny thing, my father, who had been a, a sailor in World War I, uh, loved the water. And he was going to go back in the Navy when he got out in 1919, but his father talked him into taking the, the fire exam for the Gloversville Fire Department. And so he said, I don't want that out, but I'll take the exam. And he passed it, and he spent 37 years in the Gloversville Fire Department. He never got back in the Navy. So during World War II, at the beginning, they offered him uh, a second mate position in the in the uh, merchant marine, and he was going to take it. He was interested. He was really going to take it. And us kids talked him out. I said, yeah, "There's enough of us in there. You don't have to do that." So he didn't end up going. But uh, anyway, I don't know. We uh, uh, brushed down Art, uh, the one that got killed in in World War II, uh, and I didn't tell you that he was. They say he was the first uh, service man to get uh, killed in action in World War II. And this is his picture here. And uh, uh, 
he is on that new monument along with uh, my uh, my cousin Bob and and uh, my uncle Leon up at the Kingsborough Park now that new World War II. I think it's the only family with three names on there's others with two but it's the only family with three names and then uh, I brushed G uh, gently on me and this is my picture here this was 43 in boot camp and I was 17 at the time I guess that's about it huh? did we hit them all Frank yep